right. Thanks, buddy. Glad to hear, bro. All right, Mike. So this is probably yes, all, all off script. Yep, we've we just know, prepped for five minutes, so. We know each other pretty well. I think we should start with Prince. Okay. <laughs> what do you guys think? Prince? Good starting point? Yeah, so what it, what, um, one of the things, he's like, what's different about Pandora than Omniture, Ancestry, Adobe? And one of the biggest difference is the music industry. So every answer I give is going to have that angle. Um, but one of the oddest things about the music industry and the things that have changed is that artists are now directly running their businesses. So whereas they, historically they would go to labels and labels ran most of the businesses for the, for the artists, help them find their audience, develop their music. Because of technological changes, social media and such, they often do it themselves. And Prince was way ahead of the time, uh, his time on that front. In fact... Because he was fighting with everybody early on, right? Early on, in the 90s, back before anybody really woke up to the copyright issues. If you remember, he had his own membership website back in the 90s. I mean, he was very, way ahead of his time. He also pulled all his music off of all the streaming services. And so uh, we really wanted to have Prince on the service. The other weird thing about Prince, and this kind of speaks really clearly to the way artists have taken control of their, their careers, and he was way ahead of everybody else, is he didn't have lawyers. He didn't have business development people or marketing people. Uh, he had himself, and you would, you, would get, you would be given a time that he would call a number, and, uh, you know, I would sit, literally sit there staring at my <laughs> cell phone, uh, and at the exact time, the phone would ring, and you'd pick it up, and I'd just be like, hi, this is Mike Herring, and he'd be like, hi, this is Prince, and I was like, it really is Prince, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you'd get exactly 60 minutes on the phone to get as far as you could with him. And then it would be over. Uh, and unfortunately, he passed away before we got a chance. We were really close to having a deal with him uh, at the time and now working with his estate to do that. But it just speaks that, uh, you know, uh, the music industry is really changing dramatically. It's changing how we do business. It's changing how services are uh, evolving as, as artists really take control of their music. Yeah, so one of the things I find really fascinating is the difference between an iTunes music and a Beats and... Pandora and Spotify, like, it seems like everyone took different approaches. Why, why was it that everyone took such different approaches and still there's big differences that exist and it sounds like some of them are going away? Yeah, you know, th I, I think the irony is there aren't very many approaches. I mean, if you think about uh, SaaS companies over the last 10 years, there have been, you know, about 12,000 SaaS companies, different kind of uh, software businesses funded by VCs. In that same time frame, there's been about 70 music companies. Really small number of uh, companies trying to innovate in this space. And they're really more, rather than driving to what consumers want, artifacts of the environment they were spurned. So, like iTunes is a great example. Uh, it was about originally um, providing the content that would go on iPods to sell that device, right. then later on iPhones. You know, Apple was all about selling devices, not about the music. The music was a vehicle to sell devices. Um, same thing with uh, YouTube and videos. It wasn't really about the music, it was about advertising and driving engagement with uh, listeners. Um, so you, you've had these sort of artifacts of the way they've grown. SoundCloud, if you know SoundCloud, is one of the most innovative companies in the last 10 years. Uh, I'm not sure they'll make it because it's a really tough business, but uh, they started out creating software to help DJs uh, create their mixes and then market them to their fans. That's a completely different approach than a music service. It just morphed into one because DJs like the way uh, they could distribute their music. So you've, you've only seen a handful of things come. The reason they've m come the way they are is kind of happenstance for the, the models that, that sort of spurn the original development. And then the, when they finally, the music industry sort of caught up to it, they adopted this on-demand streaming model, this 99 pricing, and it was sort of a one-size-fits-all. So whether you're at Beats or Spotify or Slacker, the, you know, there was kind of only one business to do and not a very good business at that from a profitability perspective. You know, Pandora went a completely different route, taking uh, government licenses to do radio. That means that our product was developed because of the restrictions it had under its licensing. Not because 
we really thought that was the best way to build the product. It was just the, it had to stay within a box. So really strange ways they all came up. The, re the reality is now you're really down to five players in, in a space that, you know, is going to do, you know, somewhere between 15 and 30 billion dollars in revenue over the next few, you know, by 2020. You know, uh, more than that if you, if you lump in advertising dollars. And so there's a, it's a big opportunity for those of us who are left who, who have found a way to make a business. And you compare that to what it was like maybe in the 90s when CDs were, yeah. where everyone generated their revenue. How does it compare in size? Well, from a, there's kind of two pieces. There's the content creators and then there's the distributors, right? And in the 90s with the CD, the content creators made all the money. You know, it was a 17 to $20 billion business, 99. Because if you wanted a song, you had to go buy a CD for that one song. Then Apple came up with the download, and all of a sudden, you want one song off that album, you weren't buying a $20 CD, you were buying a 99 cent download. And that $17 billion dropped to, in 2015, it hit a low of about five or six billion dollars wow. for the content creator side. That grew last year for the first time because of streaming, and, and it's a good sign. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's been a brutal transformation. It's a great example of, technology making, changing faster than business models could adapt. And so value was destroyed. That's the way the music industry would look at it. On the other side, the distributors, the tower records of the world, barely made any money, if any, in the 90s. But the distributors of the, of the 2000s and the 2010s, Google, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, even Pandora, are driving pretty significant revenues off of these new models. So it's finding the right way to balance the revenue models and profitability of the distributors with, uh, you know, paying, paying a fair royalty back to the artists so that everybody wins. You know, we need the creators, the creators need the dis distributors. Finding that balance allows both to win. And you guys are close to like a billion and a half dollars now, you said? Yeah, we'll do, uh, you know, about a billion four in 2016 in revenue. It's pretty awesome. So what, uh, I'd love to hear some, we've got, we've got some more interesting stories. Um, we were talking <laughs> about backstage, I was laughing my head off, but you know, audience here, we're tech, we're all tech folks. What are some lessons learned as you've kind of gone through, I mean, you know subscription better than anybody. You've done all sides of subscription, consumer, B2B, and, uh, you know, ad supported slash freemium. Um, you know, yeah. what are some lessons learned, some commonalities you've seen? Well, I don't know if I know it better than anybody. Um, there was a great comment in one of the earlier panels uh, that, um, at, sometimes the models change faster than the executives and the right person now in three years might be the wrong person for that business as the, as the business model environment changes faster. Um, you know, Ancestry is a great example. We took that business from, you know, we had to downsize it significantly in 2000 when the bubble collapsed. It was mostly an advertising supported business. Pivoted it entirely to subscription. Started at $7 million in revenue. Uh, you know, built that aggressively using this product down the street from Omniture called Site Catalyst and in doing attribution. Uh, we were two or three buyer of keywords on Google in 2002, 2003. Consider that an, a genealogy company in Provo, Utah was buying that many keywords. It shows you that the use of data really, we changed the way you thought about attribution models, customer acquisition costs, um, driving conversion, and then once you figure that out, it's, it's just a matter of pouring gasoline on that fire to drive growth. But the, as proud as I am of that period, you know, the period from 2006, 2007 to now, under Tim Sullivan, who was on that panel earlier, is, you know, arguably 10x better performance than what we did at that time. You know, the tools are better, the, the market changed. He, you know, in, informed it through television, brought products like the DNA product to market, diversifying the product portfolio. Like, so I think there's different things going on. Um, and that's what's exciting about it. Like, you know, we took the learnings from Ancestry, applied it to Omniture from an enterprise subscription SaaS business. Say, different in the context of uh, enterprise customers have a lot of different pressures and, and requests of the company. So you, at you, SLAs are different, your staffing is different, but the, the general financial model applied and we were able to, to, to turn, you know, one of the early SaaS businesses, really the second successful SaaS business after Salesforce um, into a really effective machine using those same ideas around driving conversion, improving cost structure over time while maintaining price, improves margin, 
the same concepts. Applied that to Adobe in the, in the transformation of Adobe. If you remember, when they bought Omsher in 2009, they shipped CDs with software. Three and a half years after buying Omniture, they shipped their last CD. It was a 100% cloud-oriented subscription business, all driven by the expertise and really the culture that Omniture brought to, brought to that company. One of, you know, I, you give Sean New, Narayan, the CEO there, a ton of credit for seeing the future and, and going out and getting the expertise he needed to make that pivot because uh, he didn't have it internally. I think that's the, that's the biggest challenge. So now I'm back in subscription That's one of again. the only transformations really at scale that we've ever seen. It's pretty amazing. I mean, right, there's... From license to... Th there are, you know, a, Autodesk, there's a few sort of corner cases, but at, at the, you know, five to eight billion dollar revenue franchise level software, you know, it's really extraordinary. And I love the... I, I'm very proud of the, of the impact and the, and the role that, that Amateur and... and uh, and the Utah office, frankly, may, you know, played in, 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 in sort of changing the culture to make that happen. So and congratulations to you, too, the big part of the culture you build you, at Amateur. You got an opportunity to cut some costs, too, which I know you love doing that. So that was probably made <laughs> you excited. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing you got to do. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, cutting costs is, in, is, is actually the least fun thing about being a CFO. I mean, when I, I was... Uh, 29 years old, a newly minted CFO at Ancestry when I laid off 400 people in the first That's not fun. 60 days. No fun. Um, but without doing that, Ancestry wouldn't exist today, right? So those hard decisions are necessary. Sometimes you don't want to wait to that point. Ancestry got too far down the line. They should what have done it. What was the, uh, I can't remember the exact story, but you, you remind me of, there was something about uh -oh. that horrible process that you had to go through to save it, but it had to do with like watering yeah, so I, I needed to make a point. You guys know where uh, Ancestry was down in, in the Riverwoods area, and they had these, like, beautiful buildings. And they're losing all this money, and it drove me crazy uh, that we spent all these money on these buildings. Uh, at the same time, we were losing money and trying to turn this business around, and, and I just didn't feel like it was appropriate that we could lay people off and still live in, have these beautiful buildings. So uh, I fired the landscapers, um, which meant that the grass all went to seed and grew up. You know, it was like two to three feet high. And, you know, a lot of people were embarrassed and complained about it. I said, well, why, I'm, I'd rather hire one more developer, make us more successful as a business, than make this place look pretty. You know, if the landlord cares about it, let him do it. I was frankly Covey at the time. Did not like me very much. Uh, I knew I had gone too far, though. This is probably the part of the story you like. Um, <laughs> All of it I like. It's awesome. It was like a it's Friday afternoon. It's and hard stuff, right? I'm sitting it's in my point. office, and six guys walk in, my head of fp and and five other guys on my team, and they're like, Mike, we want to ask a favor. We don't want to upset you. He's like, but would you be upset if we all brought our lawnmowers in Saturday morning and cut the grass? Because we want to be proud of the place we work in. And so cost cut. Cutting costs was important, but I realized I'd gone a little far there. <laughs> uh, you know, you still want to make it. Uh, you want to make sure that you're investing the right way into your employee base, into the culture of the company. And if all you're thinking about is dollars, you know, sometimes you lose sight of that. And I think that was a really good lesson for a young CFO, for sure. Well, there was a, uh, I, I love the story of your, your first business when you had a moment where you realized actually, you know, in spite of maybe... Um, maybe going too far on some things, we all do that, but the first opportunity where you're like, hmm, maybe we know in tech more than some other people know about this. I think that's a great story. Yeah, so uh, I, I do a lot of speaking at colleges and, and teach classes, and this is my favorite one to tell them because a lot of, a lot of times college students you feel like there's nothing less left to learn and, and you know, what, everything's been invented and kind of thing. And I'm like, you know, they're living in, in the world today and seeing technology change that you know, an old guy like me is never going to see. And I tell this story when I was 23 years old and I wrote my first business plan with my buddy who was selling handbags at Macy's at the time. That was his job. I was the uh, controller of a biotech company. And it was to provide stock quotes over the internet to consumers as a way of driving interest in sort of orphan stocks. Um, and we thought that was pretty cool. This new World Wide Web thing was electronic. We got a, a feed from Data Broadcasting Corporation, who had exclusive rights to stock feeds from the NASDAQ and NYSE, for 10 grand a year. 
for 10 years, we got exclusive rights to the stock feeds, but we had to do it 20 minutes delayed. If if you ever remember that 20 minute delay thing that existed in stocks. So we thought we had this great business. We built this website. It only took three minutes to load the page when you opened it up. It was super fast. Uh, Yes, it really did used to take that long in 1993. And um, we tried to raise money and could not raise money. And we, I'll never forget, we were in the office of a venture capitalist who had made over a billion dollars on Apple uh, in the prior 15 years. And he said, God, you kids are, you know, you're, I love your enthusiasm, and it's really, you know, kind of a neat idea. And I would use that maybe. He's like, but I don't understand why the general, you know, consumer would ever look on this World Wide Web for a stock quote when they could just look in the newspaper the next day. In that moment, you know, I'm sitting there, and this is like an icon, someone who I was like, this guy knows everything and I know nothing. That was my moment I realized, this guy, my buddy, who was really the idea guy, the guy who was selling handbags at Macy's because it's the only job he could get in 1993, was actually knew more about where the world was going than this venture capitalist. No offense to venture capitalists, a few of my favorite ones in the audience. Uh, and that... That, like, gave me hope, you know, that's, uh, I immediately left biotech, went into internet, and, you know, the rest is history. Um, now I'm the old guy who, who can't see around the corner, um, so I just, like, try and be around as many college students and 23-year-old handbag salesmen and Macy's as I can. <laughs> that sounded kind of creepy, so <laughs> take that back, but, uh, but, you know, the, you know what I mean, but the idea is, like, come on, come up with the, and, and you know, uh, Josh did a great program when we were at Amateur, is we did kind of, uh, these college contests where we'd get these kids to do web analytics contests using our product, you know, with creative ideas. Matt Belkin, who still works with you, uh, ran that program. We hired a lot of people out of colleges that way. Um, but we also got great product ideas out of it. You know, these kids just were like, why can't you do this? And so we actually just started doing that at Pandora last year. Cool. I, did, I did one at Stanford and uh, one at University of Michigan, uh, all using Pandora data to drive careers for artists uh, and got fantastic ideas. These kids just, you know, it's all Snapchat and this and I never even heard of that one and, you know, everyone's moving to this messaging platform and, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really fascinating at the pace of change. So you, you, you mentioned Omniture. I think uh, one thing I remember I was talking about Pandora and it seems like there's a little bit of a correlation between when you have data, you've got more information than even about companies or individuals than they even have about themselves. Sure. I know at Omniture we'd have customers where we'd have partners and since we could see let's say every email vendor we knew and, and how our customers were adopting them because they were adding for adding asking us to plug into their data we knew that Responsus was doing well and Exact Target was doing well before Responsus and Exact Target knew they were doing well because we knew how they were doing relative yeah. to the competition. I think You've told me before that you have idea about which artists are successful before the artists even know. Yeah, way before they do, before they even know their audience is coming. Uh, and, you know, that, that Genesis project, which was, yes, it was about our customers at Omniture being able to use their data to do email optimization or keyword optimization, all these kind of ways that now we take for granted, but in 2004, 2005, were pretty revolutionary. Um, that, uh, that approach also allowed us to make five acquisitions, four of which were great. Now, four out of five is a really good, really good record. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a board member who did 53 acquisitions as a CFO, and she said 52 of them failed. So I think we did better than <laughs> she did. I like to remind her that uh, regularly. But that's, be, and it wasn't because we were really strategically that smart. We used data. I mean, we knew kind of what we wanted, and then we had 450 partners using our data, and we could say, well, shoot, you know, Responsus works and this one doesn't, or Offermatica worked in, in the case of that acquisition a lot better than anybody else. And so that's, the, using data to make those decisions is critical. We use that in Pandora. We see trends long before um, they're apparent in the general public, uh, especially for artists. What kind who, of trends? Um, emerging artists that don't get radio play. So they become big. But it takes six to nine months, usually, for an artist who's unknown to start getting traction in in general. Uh, There's exceptions if they're on the right Spotify playlist or, you know, they get picked up by radio somehow or they are opening for 
you know, Halsey on tour, or they might get some exposure that moves them. But generally speaking, it's, it's, it's uh, services like Pandora that expose them early on to audiences they would never find out about. And we know by how frequently they get thumbed up, or thumbed down, or skipped, or a station created, or a song uh, from, the out, from the artist, or a station created around that song, what the sentiment is uh, based for that artist. And we use that then to go to that artist, um, in, you know, sign them up to do our live event, our, our live event stuff. If you go back a couple years, um, we did uh, Rita Ora and um, Magic and a couple of those bands. When we signed them six months before the summer, um, they, we paid like $50,000, $10,000 for their appearance fees. By the time they played, they were all in, in the top five of the Billboard 100, and it would have cost us 10x that. Um, and we're, we, have a, we now are doing, um, with our label partners, we signed a bunch of direct deals with the labels. We're now doing these trendsetter, these um, emerging artists, top 100 lists, and, uh, and our partners are using them to go sign artists long before um, they, they uh, are actually popping. And the most fun is to go and show an artist what's happening. Like, show them they're developing artists they wouldn't have ever had. And that was the Macklemore story we were talking about earlier. You know, when, when, um, when Thrift Shop came out, Thrift Shop came out in the summer, it didn't become big until late fall into the winter. And it was a huge success. But Pandora started spinning it, and the algorithm, the music genome, started spinning it on a Tupac station and on a um, West Coast rap station. And he's based in Seattle, but he started building audiences really quickly in L.A., in Minneapolis, which is very heavy hip-hop uh, environment, in Atlanta. And he had no clue. Minneapolis is heavy hip-hop? Heavy hip-hop. <laughs> Actually, you know, America is hip-hop. I mean, uh, you know, if you listen to Top 40, Ryan Seacrest and all that stuff, you wouldn't know that outside of Drake and Rihanna and such. But if you go Top 10 in Pandora in any city in the country, eight of them are going to be hip-hop. Yeah, I went to a Luke Bryan concert in the South as part of my job. See, I got some good, you know, it's a hard job, but the perks are good. Uh, and I'm walking through, and it's a bunch of guys in pickup trucks barbecuing and drinking beer listening to rap before the Luke Bryan concert. That makes I'm sense. like, it's, you know, what in the world? I mean, it, it, and it just shows you that that genre has really taken over culturally. Uh, and, you know, it's by far the biggest genre in Pandora. Country's huge. Um, the, all the niches do very well in Pandora because you can listen to whatever you want. You don't have to listen to what radio gives you or what, this, you know, what Sirius decides are the 40 uh, formats that they're going to cover. Uh, you can be as obscure as you want on Pandora. And, and so we help obscure genres get lift. And where we really see that happen is, uh, is among the hip-hop sort of pockets in places like Atlanta and Minneapolis. So you were, you were uh, that's the Yogati... That's the Yo Gotti. How many people know who Yo Gotti is? All right, that's pretty good. Hip. Um, Yo Gotti is a South Central rapper. Um, South Central he does South LA? Central LA. He doesn't get a lot of radio play because nothing he sings about is appropriate for this audience. <laughs> uh, but he's very popular on Pandora. He's about 5'5 five five and 220 and just ripped. Uh, he's and five, five? Yeah, he's short, but just buff. Okay. And he, um, and uh, like all these hip-hop guys, they want to talk to the businessman. And that's me. So, you know, I was at the Grammys, and he comes, comes up to me, and he's like, I, you know, so tell me where the money goes. Well, he's standing in front of his bodyguard, who's 6'10", 404 pounds. He's a huge dude. And every time Yo Gotti would ask me a question, he would just repeat it. So he's like, so tell me where the money goes. And he'd be like, yeah. Tell me where the money goes. And that's how the <laughs> whole conversation went. But at over an hour, we literally covered how royalties are calculated, what's the difference between a publisher and a label royalty, what the split is between the artist and the label and the publisher and the songwriter, how it gets distributed through sound exchange versus directly through the label, what the, how you do the attribution in a, in, a, in a subscription where you don't know how much music they're going to listen to and how does the revenue get allocated. And, you know, this guy was not a you know, college educated or anything, but he knew the business extremely well. It was a really fun conversation. But it could have gone a little bit faster if the 610 hype. If every it. question, I think it was just making sure I heard it clearly. <laughs> I need one of those. <laughs> yeah, I know, seriously. Hype man. 
<laughs> it gets you into a lot of clubs when you got a guy like that <laughs> in your back. That's for sure. So what's, uh, how does Pandora get its distribution? Like, yeah. where do you get new subscribers from, and what are the different formats or hardware where it exists? And yeah, so that's in big, that's fluctuating quite a bit. You know, the music, like I said earlier, the music industry has been largely artificially shaped by the way a bunch of lawyers in, in conference rooms decided things should get licensed, and that's changing a lot. Uh, and so historically we've been radio, personalized radio, and we focused on how that gets distributed. So we're in more than 1,800 CE devices, so like Roku and Sonos boxes, right. Apple TV, Fire, Google Home, Alexa's our fastest growing, you know, the Echo is our fastest growing one really? by far. Huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, it's so funny when you guys, a little aside, you know, Amazon has its own music service, of course, which it comes with your Echo. But if you look at the box when you buy it, the first thing it says is Pandora integrated right into the, because that's what drives use of the product and that's what they want. And you guys Amazon's not have trying. to pay for that or don't have to pay for that? No, we don't pay for it. It's a partnership. But we, there's no. I knew the answer to that because I know you. Yeah, I don't pay for it. I pay for that. And the, but the key is, those guys, what does Amazon really want? They're not, you know, music, yeah, they'd love for you to use their music service. They want you to buy stuff through their, through their service, right? It's a commerce company. If you don't buy anything from the commerce company, if you're not a, uh, you know, a prime subscriber, that's not a success for them. Pandora drives engagement with the product so they get used to using it, so you're more likely to buy products, so therefore they, they huh. work. So we spent a lot of time with those kind of partners. We're in over... 180 car models, half of all cars sold in the United States last year. You're on half of the cars sold in the United States last year? Yeah. But it's, you know, it's a 10 year product cycle, so it takes forever. I mean, you know, it's, I think, you know, we will get there, but like Sirius has a 12 year head start on us or something in terms of getting installed. But AM, FM radio, that's their, that's their. So does Sirius sort of go more to a model where they've got something that competes more with you and instead of just pay only and that's it? I mean, I guess they have one channel now that's advertising, but... Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't work for Sirius. Uh, but uh, they have a great subscription business that has very low churn because um, it's, it's they, they, you know, their customer acquisition strategy through the car dealerships and subsidizing uh, through the car sales process has been wildly successful, very expensive. They spent... $9 billion building a business that generates $2 billion a year. So that's, that's probably been a good return if you look at it over 25 years or 20 years. But it was pretty painful for a while. And if any of you were investors in the early 2000s, you know that. Um, but the real question is, you know, what, what happens next as you don't need $300 million satellites to deliver media into cars as they all become connected? You know, Tesla was way ahead of its time, but it's a handful. But GM's rolling out connected cars. Volvo is. Um, if I was at CES at the beginning of January, you know, every car there is talking about how it's essentially your next cell phone. It's just another line on your cell phone bill. And it changes the way you use, uh, the way you experience driving. And as we get into, you know, um, self-driving cars, it's going to change what kind of media can be delivered that way. So I think Sirius has got a lot of business model changes coming. They've done a great job with sports and Howard Stern and sort of creating the value proposition that gets people over the hump. I mean, that's what subscription's all about, right? You gotta get people to pay. They, they gotta see a value for getting their credit card out. You know, what's the value proposition? At, you know, at Ancestry, it was here's grandma's birth certificate, and then we went from there. Uh, at, at, uh, at Amateur, we helped you drive a higher ROI on your marketing spend that more than paid for the cost. Right? So it's always something. Um, and I think that's the, that's the critical you know, decision making for any music service over time is what's that differentiator. So I, I was, uh, I'll embarrass myself a little bit here. Um, uh -oh. Mike, uh, Mike slipped backstage and told me that uh, they somewhat negatively refer to a <laughs> my name as something that oh, you do in business. It was, it's compliment. <laughs> It's a compliment. Wait till you hear it. This is what it's called doing a Josh James. This is just being a, a, a visionary CEO. Um, it's, it's about, uh, I don't know, the, the, it's about. You don't have to sugarcoat it. It's I, fine. I, I can only think it. of negative ways of saying it, so <laughs> I got to think about it for a second. 
Uh, it's about being excited about your um, product and, and the vision for your company even before it's really fully realized. Uh, I'm sure that drove me crazy. There's a classic example there. Was we used to do our summit. I, I think it was in the same room maybe even. <laughs> it might have been. It might have been a grand, grand uh, America. But, and Josh had been pushing aggressively for us to do uh, SEM optimization, search engine marketing optimization within the product. And our CTO just refused to do it. And so he got up on his keynote and he announced opening the beta for their new ser our search engine marketing product, <laughs> which we had not written a line of code yet for. <laughs> and everyone was excited and a bunch of people signed up. And I, I thought that was brilliant because it was like, hey, if nobody signed up, well, at least we didn't waste any time building that product. <laughs> uh, the reality is we did build that product. We actually ended up buying another company uh, that did it and it was wildly successful um, as keyword buying went from Google only to optimizing Google and everything else and looking at attribution marketing and it actually drove a big part of our strategy. So sometimes you just gotta, you gotta force the issue a little bit. <laughs> uh, you know, and um, that's become inside Pandora. People don't even know really who Josh is but they refer to it as pulling a Josh James, so <laughs> it's a compliment. Yeah, that's how I took it. Visionary. Yeah, <laughs> visionary, that's what we'll call it. Uh, it's all good. Um, so you have been, a, it, the one thing that's fun about subscription businesses is there's a lot of metrics, and yeah. you can kind of figure out if you're flying upside down or right side up and increasing altitude or not. What are the metrics that you look at over the years and specifically now, what are the things that yeah. are the most important to you and how is your just kind of intuitive feel for the model? How has it changed? What do you, I know at Omniture, you know, we'd look at how much are we selling new and what's our retention? And that was, you know, pretty straightforward. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it hasn't changed at all and it's totally new. I mean, the, the, the difference is there's so much more data you can have now than it ever was before. And then almost an embarrassment, like too much data at times to know what to see, you can carve up, you know, by demographic and psychographic and geographic and everything you think about when, you, when, when you're Pandora and you're thinking about 80 million users of our free product in the US, you know, how do we figure out who are the ones we want to target most aggressively for subscription conversion um, and understand the cost of driving that, et cetera. Uh, you know, the base metrics, the way we think about the business, which is, you know, how do we preserve pricing so that margin on that incremental customer is as high as possible. How many subscribers then using that margin do you need to cover your operating costs? And then, you know, what's the customer acquisition cost above that? And as long as that customer acquisition cost is lower than that incremental margin, you pour on the gas. You know, uh, that's the same thing we did at Ancestry that we did at Omniture. Uh, it was scary as hell as Omniture when we hit 40% negative operating margins in Q3 of 2005, um, while Josh was telling everybody we were profitable, by the way. So, you know, there was... We were a couple quarters we were that. He was seeing the future. <laughs> uh, but we were profitable three quarters later in public because we knew what the model could do, so we were investing aggressively at that time while we were private to get there. Um, that same vision in terms of understanding how that model works, it, the concepts are all the same. Now we just get a lot more granular, right? So, um, but it's so the when same you, concept. So when you want to push the gas down yeah. uh, at Pandora and you've got that big of a database of potentials, yeah. um, what are some of the, I mean, I remember one of the most fascinating conversations we had at AOL back in the day was they would look at what would retain the customer and they knew if a customer would use AOL Music, they yeah. were much more highly likely to continue to pay for their service. What are the types of nuances that you guys have found in the data that are good predictors? So the number one thing is, uh, there's three main, it's frequency of use, so how many times you come back and use the service in a month. It's uh, the number of different devices you use. So if you use it on your mobile phone and your desktop at work and your Sonos at home, your retention characteristics are really good versus you're just a mobile user, right? Because you're already invested in it on multiple platforms. And then the last one's obvious, is time spent listening. That's the, that's where we dominate. Pandora averages across 80 million people about 23 hours of music listening per month. Put that in context, Facebook averages across their users in the United States about 13 hours per, per user per month. 
So it's by far more than any other app that's out there. That kind of retention or that, that, those factors tell us a few things. They tell us the likelihood of retention or uh, whether someone's going to churn. So if someone's using it all the time, we know churn isn't an issue. We're going to leave that person alone. If their use starts to slow, these are all pretty standard things. Engagement is what tells you how healthy your business is. And so if engagement starts to slip, and we use those three things as ways of understanding that, we have all kinds of programs that dive in to try and retain and hold on to that user. So that's really critical. Um, you know, it, and then in the customer acquisition side, so how do you keep growing? You know, when you're already 80 million users out of the 120 million smartphone users in the United States, it's hard to continue to grow that. Uh, so you focus really intently on what the customer acquisition cost is and by profile. So if this is back to the, you know, the, if those of you who've done marketing using, you know, we, we standardize this a lot in the Omniture tools in the day, but um, look-alike profiles of your best customers and then you aggressively go after those look-alikes in the market because you can calculate what your return is on that user before they've ever even come to your site. So do you have a bunch of data scientists that are going through the data and trying to find the yeah. models? How do you find those guys? How do you instruct them what to do? They're, so they're not internet people. They're not marketers. They're mathematicians. Uh, PhDs in astrophysics. Uh, that kind of, you know, the really smart people in the room. Uh, you know, people like me who aren't that smart frame it in the business context of what we go do. Find me more. And then this. once they understand that this is the math we're trying to solve for, then that's the thing. We have about 45, 50 of those guys on staff at Pandora. That's all they do. And, it, and it's how they build the algorithms that do the, uh, the playlisting. How much it's how this? we do the advertising insertion logic. It's how we do the conversion. Oh, wow. Uh, conversion. So it's all three. So yeah. how, much of that, how much of those 45 are focused on conversion increasing? Well, that's shifting dramatically as we're, we just launched uh, a new subscription product in September and a new one coming this, this quarter uh, that, to compete directly with Spotify and Apple Music and such. And so the majority of those are all moving towards uh, subscription conversion optimization. So it's a, it's a major, like if, that, if there's, you know, we have kind of three big efforts in 2017. One is driving advertising efficiency because it's like the revenue per hour is the critical profitability metric at Pandora. It's, it, yes, of course, aggregate revenue matters, but we pay on a per hour basis from a licensing perspective. So it's, it's really efficiency that matters. It's subscription conversion, driving subscription penetration. And then it's driving, selling tickets. We own a big ticketing business called Ticketfly. Uh, so it's driving uh, our 80 million users to live events. And that's it. That's all, that's the only thing we do. When, what do 2,400 people. How do you think about, think. we all have portions of our business that don't necessarily make us money, but it's part of the business model that we have, or we use it to get the word out there. You've got to, I presume, those scientists have figured out a big a chunk of your business that you know you're not going to make money from, at least for a long time, or, or maybe never, I don't know. But, you know, whether it's kids, I guess their future yeah. customers. 13 to 18-year-olds, we lose a lot of money. They listen to a lot of music, and it's really hard to monetize them. Um, and ironically, the core we monetize extremely well is 25 to 4, 54, because that's where radio advertisers have always focused. You know, uh, and so we have a very healthy business in that core, and we have a long way to go, kind of lower demographics. Uh, and 55 Is it more product, product extension? Because you're not going to get... Actually, it's demand extension. So it's tapping into um, the audience networks, the demand advertising audience networks that have been built around video and display, whether it's Google AdX or Facebook audience network or whatever. There's a bunch of independent ones as well um, that sell display and video now, and it's getting them to sell audio because that, that's our native okay. unit that's 70% of our revenue. Um, that's sort of, uh, you know, 2000, next couple of years, tapping into demand. Yeah, because you guys can drill down more than just about anybody from an audio perspective, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have incredible amounts of data. We have, you know, 80 billion plus thumbs. If you look at Google back in the day when they had the long tail, CPM rates used to be yeah. dirt cheap. And now they're really expensive because people have all figured out which niche they want. Where are you guys at in that compendium? That, that's, that is where our opportunity is. So we're already doing that in display and video, and, and if we can do that in audio, it'll change the dynamic completely. 
Um, and you can make money because we can target down to an individual. Or. You know, we ha we know not just age and gender and zip code and the music you listen to and the devices you use and the time of day you listen to different kinds of music. And uh, you know, from a lat long perspective, you know, if you are bi coastal or or you commute from. Uh, Provo to Salt Lake every day listening to Pandora. We know a lot about you from that perspective. You know, if you're listening to the Wiggles station and at 8.30 in the morning you switch to John Mayer, we know you're likely a young mother that's dropping a kid off at daycare at 8.30. So those kind of, that's a really simple example mm -hmm. of taking data and using it to carve it up. And, in, and the opportunity to do that is immense. Now we have about 1,900 data segments that have been created that way. And they're all can be inserted into these programmatic uh, platforms where you, you, you know, you, you can get as specific as you want from an advertising buy perspective. And that just brings up the pricing significantly, but everybody's getting, there's no wasted space. Got it. So also, and we're getting close to wrapping up here, but I think, you know, of, of uh, everyone in tech that knows Utah and knows Silicon Valley, you got to be at the top of the list. You've done a two, lot of both. Two successful companies here in Utah and done two companies in Silicon Valley. What's the, uh, what's the differences and more specifically, what, what's the uh, advice that you would give to companies that are here, employees that are here, that we need to do to either leverage our strengths or yeah. you know, shore up our weaknesses? Well, good news, bad news. 15 years ago, um, when I moved to Utah to do Ancestry, 16 years ago, there was a huge difference. Um, I can remember sitting in my office at Ancestry at 5.30, me and the only one in the office. My, my favorite story, and you probably um, don't even know, you don't even, probably don't even remember if you told me this, but I, my, one of my favorite stories is, so Mike, <laughs> I'm afraid definitely not Mormon, no. moved to Alpine, Utah when he moved here, had invited his neighborhood to a slip and slide party on Sunday and bring your own beer and not a lot of people came. No. <laughs> my wife was in a um, Stars and Stripes bikini. <laughs> we weren't being culturally insensitive, we were being culturally ignorant. Uh, but I learned to play ward basketball, and you know, I had a, it, it was very, after 11 months we moved to Park City. It was a great experience. Uh, nothing wrong with it. I've, by the just way, just wasn't a good fit. I've kept a lot of people from moving to Alpine with that story. <laughs> I live in Alpine, but some people from San Francisco might not necessarily love it, no. so. It, I mean, it's, it, it takes all kinds. Uh, <laughs> that balance between, you know, I learned to love that, I was working in Utah for 12 years, is the balance uh, between family and um, work. And Silicon Valley, it's often a joke talking about that balance, is there is no balance. Um, I think that's changing, I think that changed a little bit, even the time when we were running Amateur. Yeah. Uh, in Utah as well. Um, you know, my advice would be try and preserve that because that's a competitive advantage. You know, I think, I don't, I think Omniture achieved things in particular and Ancestry's achieved things in particular here and now Adobe is doing things here because they didn't try and change the way we did work here. They did, they'd um, embrace the way we did work here in ways that uh, had pretty outstanding results and, if, and were successful where Silicon Valley companies failed repeatedly. So I don't, I, don't think, I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think it's a difference. Um, I think people stay in jobs a lot longer here, which is a real positive. I think that's also changing in the last 15 years is there's more companies. You know, we always used to say it was a problem with management in Utah because there wasn't enough velocity. You know, people, by the time I was 29, I had, I had worked at four companies, had been a, the CFO of an of a internet company, you know, and I came to Ancestry and everybody looked at me like I was you know, had fallen off the turnip track. There was no way this kid could be um, the CFO of our business. But I had velocity in my career in the Bay Area had moved, had given me a lot of experiences you wouldn't have had otherwise. I think that's changed. I think it's great that Utah has so many companies now. Um, you know, it's been a lot of fun walking around here today and seeing people I worked with at Ancestry and Amateur and Adobe who are now have their own startups or are working at um, some of the up and coming uh, tech companies here, ones that have gone public. It's really exciting to see that happen. So the changes are, are blurring. Um, you know, I, I, I think the keys, uh, things that aren't changing is the entrepreneurial spirit uh, in Utah is 
is something that's pretty extraordinary. Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs go to the Bay Area to try and do things. Um, in Utah, it's just natural here. It's just in the blood uh, to, a, to a fault. I mean, we used to lose people who were doing great at Ometru to go do their startup, you know, babysitting referral service or something. It just drove me crazy. But they just couldn't, they saw the vision and they'd be back in six months. But, uh, you know, I, that I think is a real strength um, that, uh, that, is, that has been a big reason of why, you know, it, it, a few great companies started early and now you're seeing a pro proliferation go wild. So it's really cool. Awesome. Well, you guys, one of the leaders of tech in Utah for the last decade and a half or so, <laughs> President of Pandora, came out just to hear, be with us and talk with us. So really appreciate it, Mike. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Thank Mike. you.